Morning. Good evening, everyone. Please find a seat. We have a couple of seats in the front here as well. So if people are in the back and think I'd rather sit in front, uh, uh, now is the time. My name is Maarten van Essen. I'm the program director. And I always have to put the microphone way up for me. Um, I'm the program director of the John Adams Institute. And uh, welcome here to the Bali. Uh, a special word of welcome to our guest from the US. That's uh, uh, Stephen Williams, uh, the writer, author of Blockchain, The Next Everything, and Stevie Conlon, the vice president responsible for bank regulatory advisory services at Wolters Kluwer. And Wolters Kluwer is one of our main sponsors, and we have worked for many years already in the close, uh, close relationship we have. And we are grateful for uh, Baltus Kluwer for making this evil evening possible. And it's, a, as always, a pleasure working with you. Also, many uh, thanks to uh, the Dutch publisher of uh, Stephen Williams' uh, book, Atlas Contact. If you speak Dutch, uh, please do support the Dutch publishing house by buying the translation by Wieband Scheffer, which is translated into Block for Block, a gids in blockchain for iedereen. Thank you, Atlas Contact. Uh, it's important that these kind of books continue to be translated. Um, let's start off uh, with a few questions just to see what kind of audience we have in our uh, venue tonight. Um, by a show of hands, how many of you would feel comfortable explaining to someone at a birthday party what it really is and how it really works? Oh. 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 Would you, would you feel comfortable stating, uh, next question, as, as if you knew what you were talking about, that this is the technology of the future? That's a little bit less. Um, is it a transparent, democratic, unhackable, and therefore trustworthy technology? It's about the same. OK, and now. How many of you would quickly change the subject when this is discussed at a birthday party? <laughs> okay. okay. I hope you come away this evening uh, knowing more about blockchain and about one of its most widely discussed applications, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ripple. Stephen Williams writes about technology for the New York Times and Newsweek. In 2015, he founded a company called More that helps social entrepreneurs to produce more sustainably. He also heads a sustainable fashion company, a startup, which uses blockchain technology to manage distributed manufacturing. And in the meantime, he found time to write this book. You may not be surprised to know that he is a fan of blockchain. This evening's moderator is Wouter van Noord. Wouter is a technology editor at NSC Handelsblad, and he has also a newsletter called Future Affairs uh, that you can subscribe to. I highly recommend it. It's a valuable window into the world of technology. Who else is joining the party tonight? Especially for this occasion, Wolters Kluwer has flown in Stevie Conlon. She helps financial institution, institutions comply with regulatory requirements. She is also a leader with the firm's investment compliance solutions line of business, where she oversees tax regulatory, regulatory issues. In other words, she knows what it means for business to actually use blockchain and what its weaknesses are. We also have us someone who has a personal story to tell. T.L. Yula, founder of startup Tyken, uh, sorry, startup of the founder of the startup Tyken. My colleague Tracy Metz, who is very sorry that she couldn't be here tonight. Uh, she met him at an NSA live event recently where he was the moderator and also where he won again an award. Uh, Tay was born in Kuwait and had to flee during the Gulf, Gulf War to Iraq and later to Dubai. But after government buildings in Kuwait were bombed, he could never get his birth certificate. Having experienced himself how difficult it is for displaced persons to access their identity documents he decided to set up a system using blockchain where they are accessible everywhere and cannot be tampered with. So concluding, the program is as follows. Stephen will talk about his book for a while. Then Wouter van Noord will interview him. Tay will give a brief talk about his personal experiences and his company. Then Wouter will have a, discussion, a conversation with Stephen, Tay and Stephen Conlon, and of course, with you. And finally, Stephen will sign his book afterwards in the lobby. 
So there we go. Stephen, the floor is, your, floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for, for coming tonight. I really appreciate it and um, hope that I can help you understand a little bit about blockchain and maybe experience a little bit about what, what blockchain is. This is my book, which is out now in the Dutch translation, which I will try not to mispronounce, Block voor Block. It's about the culture and potential of blockchain. And I have to emphasize the word potential because we're at the very beginning of blockchain technology right now. As people and as business, we have the opportunity to imagine where blockchain can lead us and how to find our way there. But truly, we're pretty much where the internet was in the early 1990s. I remember being on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan and seeing a bus go by with a URL on it, HTTP, et cetera, and looking up and just going, what is that? And I just knew it was something really important, but I had no idea what it was. And that's where we are now with blockchains. The first thing to remember um, about let me see if I can do two things at once. The first thing to remember about blockchain is that it's a foundational technology that we use to build applications that uh, fulfill our desires. It's nothing more than software. And that's, I think, really important to remember. It makes it less intimidating. So public blockchains, there are public and private blockchains, and I focus more on public blockchains. Uh, public blockchains like the Bitcoin blockchain, the Ethereum blockchain, they have no central authority. Anyone can join one and to participate to the extent that they wish to join. They become a node or uh, a device on, on the chain. To imagine the true potential of blockchain, what worked for me the first time was to Picture yourself lying on your beach at night. You're lying on your back and you're looking up at the stars. And that star that's closest to you, the brightest star that you most identify with, look at that and imagine that it is connected to the star near it by a beam of light and that that star is connected to another star by a beam of light. And on and on until all the stars in the sky are connected to each other. And through that connection, they're connected back to your star. And to me, that in essence is the potential of blockchain and distributed systems. It's connection, it's equalization, and it's a new way of looking at, uh, at, at organizing systems, organizing societies, and distributing value. So for me, this uh, distributed nature of blockchain is really mind-breaking. Like, I, I still have trouble imagining what can happen with, with distributed systems. This is a distributed system on the right, and each one of those little dots would be a node on a blockchain. Uh, the system on the left is what we're, we're most used to, the centralized, hierarchical, patriarchal systems that we've all, we're all accustomed to and are actually very comfortable with in our lives. And so this system over here on the right presents a, uh, a great change and a great challenge for us. So a blockchain exists on all these, all these circles are nodes, and they're, de they're computer devices, but they can be electronic vehicles, they can be uh, smart toasters, smart refrigerators, they can be all sorts of devices that, that have computing power and exist on the Internet of Things and are connected to a blockchain. They all participate equally in the governance of that chain, which is vitally important to the concept of blockchain. So many people look at this diagram and they wonder, um, is it weak? It has to be weak. There's no, no leader to this. How can it run? Uh, there's no dominant node. With everything in balance, who's going to make the decisions? How will anything get done? And I find these are all perfectly sensible responses. And honestly, I don't believe we yet know exactly how these will play out in the future as they, as they scale these systems. I don't think we know the answers. I believe that they'll work in wondrous ways. But I'm, I'm not in the, uh, you know, there are certainly people who disagree with me. 
So I'm going to give you just a quick lesson in blockchain. It won't teach you everything, but it'll teach you a little bit. Keep in mind that distributed system that I was telling you about. So here's how it works. Blockchain is a ledger. Uh, in the States, my grandparents used these green books. I don't know if you had them here that had columns and you would write uh, when you sold a tractor or when you bought seed or when you saved a penny or gave a penny away. And that's basically what a blockchain is, which uh, it's a ledger. That's the most boring thing in the world, right? Um, accountants are considered to, uh, I don't want to insult anyone, but it's not considered the most exciting profession. However, ledgers really are exciting. I really have, have grown to love them. And without them, we wouldn't have cities, we wouldn't have trade routes, we wouldn't have governments, we wouldn't have schools, we wouldn't have much of a society at all without being able to consult these ledgers. So blockchain is now a ledger that exists uh, digitally and it's unhackable and it's permanent and it's transparent. So that's a big advantage to, the, to those green books. There can be public, public blockchains or private blockchains, as I said, and I find the public ones are more robust and, and obviously more likely to scale because anyone can join them. Right now, they, they are being used to record financial transactions, the creation of intellectual property, real estate titles, supply chain information, um, all kinds of things, all kinds of health data and much more. The data isn't actually uh, stored on the blockchain because that would overload the blockchain with data. What, what is stored is a cryptographic representation of the data called a hash. So these are stored or collected in, in groups that we call blocks. It's a metaphorical, uh, metaphorical uh, symbol of, of what, what is happening. The, each block refers to the previous block on the chain with a cryptographic connection. And you can see that here, that this, this hash at the bottom repeats the hash of the block zero. The hash in block two repeats the hash of block one. And so in that way, they're all connected. And if you were to make alterations to block zero, it would show up on the next two blocks. And it would be instantly apparent to, to everyone involved. That's part of their security. Another important part of their security is this distributed system, all the information is stored on all the devices that want, that want to store the information that are connected to the chain. So you'd have to make massive, massive uh, computational changes in order to alter information on a blockchain. Um, no one person or device controls it. It's a, it's a group effort, basically. So the distributed secure nature of blockchain, I believe offers a whole new way to transact with built-in trust and transparency. Truth and proof are certified by everyone who participates in the chain um, rather than by the central authority. And this opens up many possibilities for business and society. It has the potential to make things more equitable and efficient, make service, services and payments easier. It creates trust in transaction, and I think that helps improve customer relations with companies, with businesses. It can democratize the supply chain, giving people at the so-called bottom of the chain access to information that previously was available only to the people at the top, so-called top of the chain. That, to me, can, can really improve creativity within a business. Um, it lets, uh, yeah, sorry. So I'd like to ask all of you to think about, given what I've said, to think about what issues you face due to top-down hierarchical systems. Are they prone to being hacked because they're so rigid? Are they prone to disruptions because they're so rigid? Is it sometimes difficult, you know, with one person at the top maintaining the, uh, the perfection of that system, is it easier to mess it up? Um, is it sometimes difficult for hierarchical systems to pivot in response to change? I think it is. And are, do these systems have weak points? I think every system we can imagine does have many, many weak points that are exploited. So thinking about that in your lives and your business, you might profit from thinking about the potential security and creative benefits of distributed systems like blockchain. Saying that, I would advise not 
trying to fit blockchain into the old systems that we have. I think that's a mistake that's occurring right now with a lot of businesses. They're taking this new technology and trying to fit it into what they already have. Instead, I'd consider blockchain and other distributed systems to be a paradigm shift in organizing people and sharing value. It's a way to, uh, to encourage, I'm encouraging people to create new systems using this technology, not re revamp the old systems. Build a new house, don't renovate the old house. That's where the potential lies and where a lot of magic, I believe, is hiding. Curiously, my own country, the United States, is probably dragging down the effort of uh, change in blockchain. Even though we have a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of tech people very interested in doing amazing things with this technology, our government doesn't seem to get it. Just the other day, a US senator called for making Bitcoin illegal, as if that could happen. Bitcoin is, is not controlled by any central authority or any person. It would be very difficult for this senator to shut it down. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's a problem with a lot of governments around the world, not all for sure is that they um, aren't able to adapt to this rapidly changing technology. But I see that as opportunity for a lot of us, for governments that are innovative, for companies that, that really want to try to make a change. But you have to take the risk of being in the vanguard. And definitely, this blockchain, the blockchain technology is in its infancy. And it could totally collapse. It could totally fail. Right now, Bitcoin, which is uh, based on blockchain technology, is is rising rapidly and people are getting very excited. We talked about it quite a bit at dinner, but that could, that could collapse again tomorrow. So speaking of Bitcoin, I wanna get this out of the way. Bitcoin is not blockchain and blockchain is not Bitcoin. And um, every relative I have is constantly asking me, so how's your book on Bitcoin doing? And I just have to say, well, it's about blockchain. And they're like, well, uh, but, um, they're two separate things. Blockchain was actually a technology that was developed in the 60s and 70s, the, the, the precursors to the blockchain we use now. And it was used uh, to develop Bitcoin, to track where the coins were spent, uh, who, who owned what coin, and where they existed. That was in 2008. But people realized very quickly that blockchain was a valuable foundational technology for many other, other projects. So that said, Bitcoin and all these other coins and different types of tokens, when combined with blockchain, can create uh, incredible incentives for uh, altering behaviors, for encouraging certain behaviors, and for uh, creating new economies that people can use. The types of economies that we don't even, can, can hardly even imagine now, are being imagined by a lot of economists, crypto economists around the world. And I think in the next five years, you're going to see a lot of change in, our, in the way that we do business, the way we spend money, and the way we transfer value from person to person, company to company. And the thing that's going to stand in the way are the government regulations. They also might help us from exploitation, but I think that, that there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of walls. So people always wonder where these coins get their value. Like, why is Bitcoin today worth $7,000? Or is it 7,800 today? And yesterday it was worth 6,000. A few weeks ago it was worth 3,000. Why is that? Basically, it's because people believe in Bitcoin, because there's a limited amount of Bitcoin, and because people are ascribing value to it. On the left, we have gold. And all of us understand gold, right? We all value gold. And we all think that we understand why it's worth something. But I'd like you after this speech to, uh, to go home and really think about why is gold worth anything? Really, um, is it just because of the color or because you can make jewelry out of it? What makes gold valuable? And, th and then think about what makes Bitcoin valuable. The, I believe the value comes from our beliefs, our trust, limited supply and other, uh, other, other factors. Um, we all understand gold, we think, but on the right is, is money also. And this is a photo of my MetaMask wallet. It's a type of wallet for storing value of cryptocurrency and non-fungible tokens, which I'll get to in a minute. At the top where it says 5924 ETH. I'm sorry? 
Oh, I'm sorry. At the top, it says uh, 5924 ETH. ETH. Ether is a type of coin on the Ethereum blockchain. And that is, uh, that is the value that's in this particular wallet. At the time of this, a few weeks ago, it was worth $97. Now it's worth uh, maybe $180. At the bottom here is, is a coin that represents a piece of artwork that I got uh, for free in a giveaway. You can see it cost me zero ETH. And at the bottom below that is another token that represents a physical object, a piece of artwork, not a physical object, a digital asset. That is another piece of artwork, which you'll see later in the slideshow, that cost me 1.50 ETH. So this is, this is money on the blockchain right here. And I don't know how many of you have seen that, but that's, that's what it looks like in one form. So those two coins that I showed you of artwork are called NFTs or non-fungible tokens. And they, re they represent objects. They are, you have one token assigned to one object or one digital asset. And a digital asset is, uh, can be a book, can be a piece of artwork, it can be anything that's digital on, on, the, on the internet or on the blockchain. Um, these, these are something that has entered the blockchain space in a big way in the last year, and I think that they, they're going to be incredibly important as we go forward. They allow for amazing use cases and some pretty silly use cases also. They can represent any object or digital asset. You can track the movement of that object through its life cycle, you know, following these tokens, you can put information that you want on that, on that token that, that tells you more and more about this object. You can reward people for good behavior with the tokens. You can collect, it, collect them like porcelain figurines. You can collect them, there are digital cats called crypto kitties you can collect. There are digital punk rockers called crypto punks that you can collect. Um, there's all kinds of artwork that you can collect. They encourage really radical thinking and new forms of, of economies. I'm, I'm totally uh, consumed by, by thinking about what they can do for us in the future. We're really at the infancy of understanding NFTs, but I really think they'll benefit from intense creative experimentation. And I encourage all of you to remember this NFT and to think about it and to look into it for your lives and business. And I'm sure a lot of this seems uh, hard to understand, and I'm just really trying to, to give you a sense of the potential for this technology, and we'll get to more of that in a minute. Another really key concept is a smart contract. These are uh, basically um, uh, digital contracts that are self-enforcing. They've been programmed to fulfill themselves if certain conditions are met, just like a regular program. Uh, lawyers draw them up. Um, they're in use now, though they're still also in their infancy, but they're widely used, especially on the Ethereum blockchain. Every large law firm in New York City where I live is obsessed with these. They all have departments of people in suits who are studying these uh, very heavily because they're afraid that these devices will put them out of business. In truth, I, I feel that our fears about machines taking over from humans is just a fantastical fear. And my, my belief is that it's far more likely that we'll harness tools like this to help us create what we want in the future. I believe that about AI also, which will also uh, be used quite a bit with blockchain as we go forward. So blockchain is a foundational technology. I would compare it to electricity. I would compare it to the wheel. And I know that probably sounds ridiculous, but this is how I feel. It allows us to construct, construct fantastic things on top of it. Walmart has built an app that tracks the flow of lettuce from the farm to the store. Uh, a year or in January in the US, romaine lettuce was contaminated and half the country was told not to eat any romaine lettuce even though it came from many different supply chains. With Walmart's system for tracking lettuce, they would have known exactly where that lettuce originated and would have been able to tell people to avoid those certain batches. So it's very, it has practical uses in that way. Maersk has streamlined the shipping supply chain with blockchain. I believe they say that there were 200 steps between shipping flowers from South Africa to Holland and uh, 
each one of those was a paper trail or a complicated computer trail that had to be entered separately. So they set up a, a blockchain supply chain that streamlined the whole process and, and made it much less expensive and much more effective. Christie's Auction House is using uh, blockchain to track art. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people are using it to track many, many different things. And I, what I'm trying to say is we can create the world we want on top of blockchain. It's not the only technology, but it's, it's one that we can really use. So these are applications called dApps because they're distributed ap applications. I prefer just to call them apps, but the, the cool way to call them is dApps. So you can say it however you want. If you go to a website called stateofthedapps.com, you can see every dApp that's been created on the Ethereum blockchain. It's a few thousand, maybe 2,800. And it's really interesting because they cover all kinds of use cases. Um, as you can see here, there's a dating, dating dApp. There's a Turboth dApp, which I have no idea what that is. There's Crypto Sword and Magic, which sounds like a game. Um, and the, but the other really interesting thing about this is you can see how much these dApps are used. And in truth, there's very little use of these dApps. And that shows you, how, you know, that we are in the infancy with this technology. And also that right now the interface, the user experience for most blockchain uh, applications is really poor. And I think that, that we really need to get artists, uh, students of literature, designers, and a lot of humanists involved with designing these applications to help the engineers make them more useful for all of us. Because right now, I've, I'm challenged when I try to use different, different applications. And so someone coming new to this, you could find it a little difficult. You might spend a lot of time watching YouTube videos, as I have. So this next uh, use case is definitely fanciful, and it, it's not going to take place in the near future, but I believe it is technically feasible and will take place. And it's called the DAO, the Distributed Autonomous Organization. And I'm going to uh, tell you uh, about one DAO that I think would be pretty wild. So say I have a, buy a self-driving car and I put it to work as a taxi sometime in the future. And so this car drives 24 seven all over Amsterdam, picking up passengers, getting its fares through a blockchain system, not through Uber or anything like that. It's a direct system. It gets paid in cryptocurrency, it deposits its money in its wallet. When it runs out of electricity, it fills up and pays for it itself. When the tire breaks, it calls a repair shop, it comes and fix it, and it pays for it with cryptocurrency. Um, it does this for several months or a year, and then it makes so much money, it comes to me and makes me an offer I, I can't refuse, just like in The Godfather. And I say yes, and the car is basically liberated and owns itself. And the car goes and begins working on its own and earning money, and because it never takes a break for cappuccino, it never goes on vacation to Spain. It just keeps working all the time. It gets rich very quickly, and it's, a, it, it's intelligent enough to buy another car just like it. And then those two cars together buy another car, and pretty soon, who knows what happens? You have 500 cars that have no human involvement. What does that mean for our society? What does it mean for our economic system? And what does it mean for us? I, I really, I don't know what to say about that, but it's, it's a nice thought. It's something I try to think about when I'm falling asleep at night. <laughs> and this is actually happening right now. Now this is, uh, I can't vouch for this business, although they have a very, um, a very ambitious rollout plan for 2019 and, and 2020. But this is a, a medical DAO. It could be a total scam. I really can't tell you whether it's not. But what they're planning to do is bring doctors from all over the world together using coins and incentives and solve people's medical problems on a distributed system that would have no centralized authority. I can imagine all kinds of regul regulatory problems they will have, but I think it's really interesting that people are already using this concept of the distributed autonomous organization 
in our lives right now. So this is what I love. I love uh, rare digital art. To me, it's the most exciting, uh, exciting thing in my life because I like collecting it. I don't really collect Bitcoin or anything like that, but I buy this art that may be totally worthless, but it's, it's really fun for me to play with. So rare digital art does not sound ridiculous. Like how can digital art be rare because you can just copy it and paste it and make prints of it and do whatever you want with it. But in truth, it's, it's been proven in the last, it's only been in the last year and a half or so that this has taken off, that when you have a cryptographic code registering the first example of a digital artwork or any piece of intellectual property on a blockchain, it gives it value. It's like the first edition of a print that is signed one of three or one of one. It's exactly that same concept and people are really accepting it and these things are, have value and they're traded and they increase in value. These are called autoglyphs and they were recently made about uh, four weeks ago. They're generated by artificial intelligence. There is no human, human hand in these and they live in smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. I saw on Twitter one day that they were for sale. They were $33 a piece and the prof there were about 500 of them. The profits were going to benefit 360.org, which is an anti-climate change organization in the US. And so I immediately, I support 360.org. I went to buy some, they were sold out in two hours. So I went to a secondary market called Open Ocean and bought uh, one of these, I believe it was that one, uh, for uh, four times its original value. And now in the time I've had it, it's also gone up in value. But I just keep it, basically I don't ever even look at it. I look at the little token on my phone. If I wanna see the artwork, I can pull it up on my computer. This is the weird world that I'm in. <laughs> But I like it. I also own Adams of a, of a movie by a, video, a famous video artist. She divided the last copy of an art film that she made into 2,000 segments she calls Adams. I bought three of these, and in order for her to show that entire film, she has to get permission using this distributed system to, uh, to show all of our cells, all of our atoms. And if some people refuse or don't answer her, her query, then the film shows with patches missing from it. It's really interesting, but that kind of enhances the, the artwork itself. So that's rare digital art, and I encourage you to invest in that, not in blockchain, not in Bitcoin. So this is a very uh, important concept, and you're going to hear a very interesting use case about this later, so I won't go into it too far, but blockchain offers the, the chance for all of us to have a digital identity, and that includes the 1.2 billion people on Earth who right now have no identity. They have no identity cards. It's very difficult for them to access financial systems, to get phones, to go to school, to get healthcare, to, do, to participate in the modern society. So you can have a, an identity that you control on the blockchain. It contains all of your information, all the data that you want, maybe your medical records, different things, and you can determine what is released. It's completely controlled by you. And the example I like to give is I have a 21-year-old, and if she goes into a store to buy a beer, uh, she has to show her driver's license, which reveals a lot of information about her, a lot of data that we routinely just give away. But I don't want that guy in the, uh, the store to actually know where she lives. I don't think that's, that's necessarily good. With a digital ID, you might just be able to reveal, certified by the state, this person is 21 years old, and you wouldn't even have to give the name of the person. So I think that's really interesting. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and there are great prospects for this to control your social media data and to keep data out of the hands of the giant uh, harvesters such as Facebook and, and Google. Another area I'm very interested in is sustainability, as I'm sure uh, most of us here are, because we have to be going forward. And blockchain offers uh, many, many, many opportunities for sustainable action. This one I really like. Um, I know the founder of this. Um, 
he has a data company in Jakarta, and he, he spent some time in a village when he was young with farmers, and he would see how they, when they had crop failure or monsoons or different reasons to get seeds or uh, different, different needs uh, for their farm, they would often have to borrow money from um, loan sharks. And those loan sharks would be expensive and sometimes violent. So he set up a blockchain system that allows them, using very simple phones, to register their land, their own identity, their crop yields, and all of their banking information. And they can, instead of going to a loan shark, they can send it to a bank in the capital and receive a loan often on the very same day. And they can take that money, which is cryptocurrency, and use it in the local farm store to get the supplies that they need. And curiously, the repayment on these loans is 100% so far. So it's been very successful. So this is a company that, that I'm uh, starting. It's a startup now, and I'm in the middle of trying to figure it out, and it's very complex. But what I hope to do is incentivize manufacturers in different industries to reuse products and to use less materials. And the, uh, the goal of that, obviously, is to reduce carbon output and waste. And I'm starting with fashion. And what we will do is have uh, NFTs or some other technology to track each item as it passes through through the secondhand supply chain, from person to person, or person to store, or store to person. And then we will reward people who reuse materials with coins. We will also reward businesses that reuse materials with coins. Now, to do this, we have to create an economy in which those coins will have a value. And this is the incredibly tricky part, is how to make those increase in value and make this whole process worthwhile. But I just wanted to point that out. That's uh, something that I'm working on, and I hope, hope it will scale because it's distributed and have a, have a huge impact in the next few years on the carbon levels being put out into our environment. So this is just an introduction to a technology that obviously I think is amazing. I know it has tons of problems. I kind of glossed over all of those, but there are many, and uh, I hope I hope it'll have a positive influence on your lives and businesses going forward, and that just give you a chance to kind of think about this and ponder it. And definitely think about the self-driving cars when you're trying to go to sleep tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen, for this very down-to-earth talk about a topic that is so often sort of being overhyped, uh, mm -hmm. I think. So that was really refreshing. Oh, good. Uh, can I pour you some water? Yes, thank you. Uh, me personally, I kind of have a hate-love relationship with cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. I've been writing about them for some time, but uh, in 2015, when Ethereum was being launched, I wrote uh, an article with the headline, Ethereum, Ethereum, remember those words. Uh -huh. And I forgot to invest. Um, <laughs> In 2018, uh, at the height of the bubble, uh, 2017, at the height of the bubble, I wrote uh, an article headlining, there's definitely a bubble going on, and I forgot to sell the very few oh, no. <laughs> uh, cryptocurrencies that I had. So, uh, are, have you been more lucky? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, actually, I'm not, uh, curiously, I'm not interested in uh, investing or in, in making money in that way, and that's just a personal quirk that my two wives have both regretted, and um, <laughs> my, my children also. So, but I'm more interested in, in cryptocurrencies as the way of incentivizing people within organizations. Right. So um, I have, a, I have a, maybe a few thousand dollars worth of uh, Ether and Litecoin. Okay. So it'll be great if it goes to a million dollars and I can retire. But that... Lately, the, the, the crypto winter has been sort of uh, melting away a bit. Yeah, spring uh, is here. Spring, spring is here, do you think so? Uh, I, we discussed this at dinner. I, I don't. I don't think that uh, Bitcoin right now, as I said, is at, uh, over 7000 almost $8,000. And I think it might go up for a while, but I, then I think it will go back down. I, I do not believe in... Bitcoin going to a million dollars, Bitcoin going to $50,000. I just don't think it will happen because 
uh, so far, the use cases for Bitcoin are few, and the, uh, the, the biggest use case seems to me to be to speculate, financial speculation. All right, but your, your talk was quite bullish, quite optimistic about uh, blockchain's future. Where, where does this optimism come from then? Well, so blockchain's future is not based on the price of Bitcoin. In fact, I think the, the drop in the price of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency actually aided blockchain's future because it, it separated the chaff from the wheat. So the people who are thinking about the possibilities of, of blockchain technology as a, you know, a real world changing technology have stuck with it and are still thinking about it. And there are some of them in this room here. And the, the people who are into uh, Bitcoin for the sole purpose of being able to purchase a Lamborghini they're gone. They've moved on to greener pastures. And they might come back, but I think actually the lower prices of cryptocurrency is, is great. It, it has made me quite the skeptic, I must say, because if I look at my email inbox just now, there, there are all kinds of promises regarding blockchain. It's going to solve, solve world hunger. Right. Uh, there's blockchain for supermarkets, blockchain for art fraud, um, so many different applications. And this can mean two things. It can mean that blockchains are actually conquering the world at an incredible pace, or it can mean that the predominant business model in blockchain is talking about blockchain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good point. And honestly, I think right now the basic model is talking about blockchain. It's not conquering the world. It's not fast enough. It's not diverse <laughs> enough. But that doesn't mean that it won't be. So I think that we're, as I said, um, you know, a few times we're in the infancy. And I do think that Certainly, it's not conquering world hunger now, but the, uh, the ideas that are being applied to, especially AI and blockchain and world hunger, are pretty fascinating and compelling. And I do think that in the next five years, you're going to see quite a few big developments. Um, it seems you, see, you seem quite sober and down to earth, and that that that. Uh, oh, I'm a total makes, dreamer. But, but it, it makes me very curious yeah. why you thought this was actually worth writing a book, uh, spending spending maybe a year or more delving into this topic. And um, yeah, so four years ago, I, w I went back to um, a university to get an MBA in sustainability, and uh, I was the oldest person there. Everyone thought I was a professor, but um, I. Uh, I was in my first class and I heard the word blockchain. And so I thought, that's a curious word. I'm a writer. It's kind of a clunky, ugly word, and, but it really intrigued me. I went home and read about it and uh, immediately, as they say, went down the rabbit hole and became obsessed with this and, and taught myself um, for, I would say, two and a half, three years before I decided to do the book. And I did write the book because I did, hadn't read any other book that used uh, storytelling, that used color, that used anecdotes, and that also talked about the people who are involved in this. There are a lot of really interesting characters involved with blockchain. Yeah, because that's what you write in the book, right? You, you describe blockchain as a, as a subcultural phenomena. Yeah, uh, for But sure. then still, um, you could also write a book about Magic the, Ga the Gathering, uh, and you chose blockchain. So what, what sets blockchain apart from other subcultures, and what makes it such a, a big and promising cultural phenomenon? Well, I think the distributed nature is, if, if I were to choose the one thing about blockchain that I think will be world-changing, it's the distributed nature. Yeah, yeah. like in the example of the DAO, self-driving yeah. cars uh, yeah. developing yeah. itself. And you, you actually raised an important big question in your talk about this uh, self-driving car DAO. You, you asked the question, you posed the question, what does it mean to society? But you didn't answer it. Could you yeah. <laughs> try to do it? Okay. What I think that sort of system will mean for society is that we will have more leisure, right? And more that free we, time. More yeah. leisure time, yeah. That we will maybe redefine what it means to work and, and what kind of work that we do and what is the purpose of work. If we have machines that are able to do a lot of our work for us, I think it's going to cause a, you know, a real, uh, maybe a crisis of, of thinking in our societies, and um, you know, I'm sure it'll be really hard on, hard on the Americans, <laughs> but and the Japanese because we all like to work so much. But uh, <laughs> so better for the Europeans in that yeah, sense. Well, yeah. from what I can see, yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm still I'm working now, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding.
Um, we'll, we'll be able to delve into the, the big questions around blockchain in the, in the upcoming panel discussion. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll give the floor to some questions in the audience as well uh, by that time. But for now, we're going to listen to uh, someone else with a very special story. I had the pleasure of interviewing Tay for NRC. Um, and this guy is a blockchain entrepreneur trying to solve some of the hardest questions uh, maybe in the world right now is identity, how to prove who you are. And uh, he has a very uh, interesting and personal story to tell about uh, that topic and how that relates to the blockchain. So please give a big hand to Tay and also to Steven, of course. Thank you. You can stand there, Tay. Or walk around, whatever yeah, you, think, you please. Uh, yeah. You're used to working. pitching. Yeah. Uh, you can give me the time. Yeah, you just talk away. You're so used to pitching. He won every single pitching competition in the last few months. So. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tay, as I was introduced. And I usually introduce myself as the invisible man. I know that you can all see me here. There will be no magic show or smoke coming up. The title invisible is given to people who do not have a birth certificate. And during the Gulf War in 1990, the birth registries were destroyed. So I was born in Kuwait. My father does not own oil wells. We're not shareholders in Shell. And during the Gulf War, we had to leave the country and migrate to Lebanon. I have my driving license on me, not, let me then go quickly back. That's my driving license, so under the place of birth, it's written on weekend. Um, today, similar to my case, there are 290 million children under the age of five. They're not as lucky as I am to have had this document at birth. So at the age of five, I lost my birth certificate. Today we have 290 million children who do not have this right at birth. And I'm sure that everyone in this room takes the birth certificate for granted. I can bet on one Bitcoin that someone in this room has his birth certificate either in a drawer where his socks are or on a shoebox where you put the old paper. So beyond the children under the age of five, we have 640 million children between zero and 16. They also don't have a birth certificate. Globally, we have 1.2 billion unidentified people. So what does these numbers mean? Why do they matter for you to know? Because without this document, People cannot have healthcare, education, and most importantly, money. You cannot open a bank account. So it was not enough for me to be labeled as invisible. I had the pleasure to live the life of the invisible man, to be literally invisible. I came to the Netherlands in 2010 to be what we call a Kennedy migrant or a knowledge worker as a software trainer in the healthcare industry. And I came from Dubai. This is where I was recruited from. I had three cars, one for the desert on Fridays, one to go to work, and one to show off. <laughs> I used to live in the apartment 1810. That means I live on the 18th floor. I have the whole skyline of Dubai right on my hand and right in my eyesight. If I wanted to eat kebab four in the morning, I just dial a number, it gets delivered to my house. That's how people live in Dubai. When I came to the Netherlands in 2010, I saw tall people, small houses, and everyone on a bicycle. I was like, where, I, where, where am I actually? In university, I studied that Europe is so much advanced. I was expecting to see maybe flying cars or something out of the ordinary. And then I started living the Dutch dream. 
I cheer for Ado Den Haag on Sunday. I complain about the weather. I don't <laughs> complain about the taxes. But it wasn't enough to be Dutch. And dreams, living the Dutch dream that must last forever. In 2014, my work contract expired. And in 24 hours, my life flipped upside down. From a Bitcoin miner, as a software trainer, as a Kenneth immigrant, as living in my own apartment, wrapping myself in the new IKEA blanket. 23 September 2014, that was the night. 24 September 2014, I was sleeping in prison on a cold floor and not knowing what tomorrow would happen. I was in the asylum detention center in Ter Apel. It was the first time that I knew Ter Apel existed. For me, Netherlands was Amsterdam, Den Haag, Rotterdam, that triangle. My father is Syrian, so I carry the Syrian nationality. I don't have a Kuwaiti passport. I don't have a Lebanese passport. And I don't have an American passport. I have one document, which is my Syrian passport. Because of the climax of the civil war in 2014, I couldn't leave the Netherlands to go to any other country and asylum was, was the only uh, chance to, to stay. Now, as you can imagine, in an asylum camp, they don't give you the best quality of food, not like the food we had today for uh, dinner. But we get, in the morning, uh, three slices of bread and cheese. For lunch, we get one egg and a cup of soup. And for dinner, it was rice and cooked vegetables. Remember, as an asylum seeker, you don't have any type of documents on you. You give everything to the IND so they can do the check and they can verify where you, where you came from. I came from Den Haag. I don't know how hard is that to verify, but still. It took me two years to finish the asylum process. And in those two years, we're living on the same type of food. The only thing I had on me was my smartphone and my Bitcoin wallet. Now, as a Bitcoin miner, I had a few Bitcoins on my phone, and I was fed up from the food. So I went to thaisbesort.nl or takeaway.com, and I ordered a large pepperoni pizza, the largest pizza I can find. And I paid up front in Bitcoin with it. And this was a victory. This was a victory because we broke the financial barriers around this camp. We broke the barriers that say, if you do not have an identity, you cannot have a bank account. And this was chaos in the camp, because now there's a new type of food that wants to come in, the delivery guy with his yellow jacket, he wants to come in the camp, and he's not allowed to. And the refugees were asking, where did you get the money to, 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 to pay for it? We have cash, they have cash in their pockets, but cash doesn't transact online. And even if you order it and you promise to pay it on delivery, no delivery will come to an asset, say, if it's not paid up front. So that moment, it was when I started to think, can we use that technology to do something more than money? Can we break other barriers, like identity? Because our identities today, they're similar in one way or another to money. A centralized institution, money, it's the central bank issuing, printing, and telling you people it's backed by gold, backed by this, backed by that, use the euro, use the dollar. Similar in our identities, we have the municipality, we have the whole set of institutions in the Netherlands that issue your documents. And especially in birth certificates, it's saved in the Ministry of Justice, in the safe, in the vault. So you don't own your birth certificates. It's not your ownership, it's the ownership of the government. In other words, we are property of the government, which is, I think, is true if you relate to the US, that debt is created when humans are born. Every human being that is born in this planet, there is a certain debt attached to him or to her. So how can we free our identities? How can we have, similar to Bitcoin, a decentralized way of verifying who we are? If we look at identities, they're merely a piece of paper that is signed by someone who has authority. So if we take that paper and that ink, we transform it into a digital 
scarce signature that cannot be frauded, that cannot be deleted, that cannot be tampered with, available 24 hours, any time that we want, we can call it and we can check if the signature is original, that's where blockchain is needed. So we're using that technology to build an open source identity system. We offer it for NGOs and for their partners, like vaccine centers, like healthcare institutions, like microfinance providers, and even governments, so that they can check the signatures of NGOs, and NGOs are able to sign and verify identities of the people they help. So what we achieve here is first, we reduce the duplication in identities, we reduce the time it takes to issue an identity, and most important, you're reducing fraud in issuing fake or unknown IDs, since all the signatures, and I say signatures, not personal information, is traced through this ledger. Data is on the phone, it's not stored in the server, not in the Google Cloud, not in the Amazon Cloud, it's on the phone of the user. If he loses his phone, as they say in Dutch, pech, bad luck, you can be reinstated in the system one more time, but the risks are much more lower than we lose the identity of the whole population, similar to what happened in Syria, similar to what's happening in Venezuela, and what's happening uh, in uh, Malawi due to natural uh, disasters. So if you're thinking, hey, but yeah, refugees, displaced people, we're living in Amsterdam, we're happy, we're safe, life is good, it's sunshine. Ajax almost made it to the cup. We're not safe. We're not safe for two reasons. One that is shorter. We're not safe because our identities are hacked, breached, and leaked on a daily basis. Similar to my first bet, I can also bet that there is someone in this room whose email was hacked or breached this year at least. And this is a threat to our democracy, number one a threat to the way we conduct politics, we conduct voting, especially that we are going in a European Union uh, voting level now. So what has Facebook done, for example, today, is they double down on their fake uh, posts and their fake identities that they have on, on Facebook. The, the long-term threat that we have is one of you or one of your children will be a refugee in the next 10 to 15 years. And why that bold statement is because climate change does not discriminate. If you have a Dutch passport, climate change will not tell you, sorry, you're Dutch, I will not affect you. Don't forget where we live, in the lowlands, underwater, Nederland, this is the, when I learned Dutch, Nederland means under. The first degree that will increase in the world temperature, we will be swimming here. And our databases, our identities, we will have to be moved, we will move into new countries. Do you want to be moved with a smartphone or carry 14 kilograms of paper like what I did? So learn from my experience, learn from the lessons of the invisible man because it's only through stories and through lessons that we learn and we actually do something. And I know we have a big bureaucratic system here. It put me two years in a camp. I complain about the bureaucracy as well. But I think today we have a real chance in taking things back into our hands because the proof is similar to how decentralization changed the way we communicate. I don't have to send a post letter to my grandma in Syria anymore. She uses her finger to swipe a screen, press a button, and call with me. And that's what blockchain will bring to the world of money and identities. And once we release money from that evil, from that centralized manipulating system it is today, then we will be seeing real freedom and we'll be seeing amazing stuff happen. And that's why. I personally join also Stefan in his vision that it is a world-changing technology. History has proven how technology can move us forward, and today I think we are making history. Thank you so much.
Okay. Thank you so much again. A very touching story, as always. Um, I, one, one quick question for Tay uh, to kick it off, because um, what strikes me is that a lot of technologies uh, that solve problems create their own problems. And if I hear you speak about identities in an immutable ledger, it makes me think about storing stuff like color of the skin, religion, uh, ethnic background into an immutable ledger. Would we really want that? Yeah. Um, I think it's a, it's a pretty valid question, and that's what everyone today is, is asking. And, and again, I say it, and I think we have this problem with the media and with the reporters, not with you personally. <laughs> but Be careful. It You're is, not done yet. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is, we always have to say we are not storing data on the blockchain. What we are storing are signatures. Signatures that mean it's a similar to your house key. You have two types of keys, one for your front door, one for your main door. The front door is, is the same key that your whole building uses. Your whole neighbors, they share the same key. But your house key is one, is one unique for you. That's called the private key, your house key, and that you sign IDs, you allow people to enter in your house. But this means when we are building a technology, we don't need to build it with bias. So the, the issues you're talking about, this is coding software issues mm. that when we are writing the code, we must write the code in a non-biased uh, okay. non way. Well, we'll maybe d continue this discussion later on, but uh, first I uh, would like a big round of applause for uh, Stevie Conlon, uh, which is joining, who is joining uh, the panel tonight as well. Um, and Stevie flew in from the US, especially for this actually, and uh, you are uh, the lead blockchain for Walters Kluwer, which, a com which is a company that most in, people in the room would probably think still makes uh, printed books, printed study books. So why blockchain and Walters Kluwer? That's, that's the first thing that came to my mind. Well, I, I think that that's a common, I think that's a common misconception because I think we've really um, become sort of an information technology company. I think that's our profile. And um, I think blo blockchain is just one more example of the sorts of things that we're looking at to help our, our customers and, and, to, help, and to help um, everyone with, with, with services and things that they need. So it, it is quite a change, but I think it's evolutionary. Um, when I started, uh, Walter, uh, we did use paper. You know, back in the day, we used yep. paper. There was no Excel spreadsheet. There was no computer. Uh, this predates the smartphone. So, so uh, things have changed, and so I think we all have to change too. And we, we're here in a quite bullish panel on, on blockchain. I, I seem to be the skeptic here, and I, I, I take it that you are quite optimistic about the technology as well. Um, I believe that the tipping point is passed for, for blockchain and cryptocurrency. I think that both blockchain and cryptocurrency offer things that are attractive to people and that there, there is adoption. Now, the speed of adoption, the, how it will be used um, is still unclear, but uh, I, th I think it's already happened. And how, how, how are you guys using it? Well, um, we use it um, in some of our uh, applications that relate to protecting electronic signatures. So we talked before about identity. And if you think about it, you can use the system to sort of verify the quality of a signature. And so that's one way we try to use tools like that. And, and again, I think the, the whole issue is, is, as Stephen was talking about, is there are so many ways we're gonna see blockchain being used. And I, I think what, a lot What do of you it, think the most promising is outside of your own field? If, yeah. if you, you go to a lot of conferences about this technology yeah. as well, but what was the, the, the one use case you thought, wow, this is going so fast and already changing life fundamentally? So I think you know, there's been a lot of discussion, maybe you've heard this as well, about using uh, blockchain payments to, um, to speed cross-border payments. 
Yeah. So like, I have like a Western Union type. Correct. Of, uh, I, I think people are really excited because the belief is that there's a lot of sort of middle steps in the, in the process and it's slow. I, I, I think that one of the fascinating things about blockchain is when, you know, we all have smartphones, we want th want to see things on our phone immediately. All right. Zero lag. Um, what's, what, what can I look at right now? And I think that blockchain offers that sort of benefit for things like, um, like payments. I think it's really an exciting but time. But blockchain so far has also proven to be quite slow in some respects, right? If well, you talk about a seamless and fast user uh, experience, then blockchain might not be as fast as a, uh, a bank. That, that's, a great, that's a great point. So I think that, you know, uh, I'm, uh, my real area of focus is regulatory. And what are the regulatory concerns you need to worry about? And how can we help you if you, if you have a blockchain or you're thinking of using it? Um, so when, when we think about the various types of people we work with, how can we help them? But when you come back to your question, I think there, we, what we found is that there are some applications of blockchain where it is fast because it relates to the amount of data, I think, fundamentally that you, you need on each block, mm -hmm. in each coin, whatever you want to call it. And I think that where the challenge is, is that we don't have, um, this isn't science fiction where everything just moves at, um, instantaneously yet. So I think as it, people are bullish that with advances in computer speed, which we've definitely seen you know, year after year generally, um, that we'll be able to move more and more amounts of data quickly by blockchain. You, you mentioned science fiction, and for the sake of discussion, also to prevent it from being too technical and too nitty-gritty into the details, I think the, the main question we want to answer tonight is maybe uh, have a peek into the future, say 20 years from now, and uh, let's assume that blockchain works and that a lot of the promises are actually being fulfilled. Um, what would a world run by blockchains look like and uh, should we be happy about that and um, I'm also quite curious about what the audience thinks about that question so if the world is run by blockchains in 20 years who would be happy with that who would be who would think that's a good idea compared to the, uh, the world run by banks and governments as it is now it's a minority I guess and who, who would prefer to stay the same, a centralized system with governments and banks? That's even less, actually. Okay. <laughs> wow. And I, I'm also curious about the panel. Uh, well, what do you guys I'd think? I'd like to say, and I think in 20 years, the, no one will use the word blockchain. I think in five years, uh, you won't need to know that you're using blockchain. You'll just, like nobody says internet, the global network of computers anymore. Right. And, yeah. and you'll just be using it. No one... Uh, you talk about your email, you don't talk about what makes your email work. So I, I don't, th I think right now we're in the peak blockchain talk and in a few years it, it won't exist. I'll have to change the title of my book. <laughs> and how about you, Tay? Yeah, I, you, can use, you can use that mic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry for that. Yeah, I think the world, if it's run by girls, is uh, much better. But. Uh, but do you, do you think a world run by blockchains uh, no, uh, will I, I happen? And do you think it's a good idea? No, I don't think it, the world will be run by, by, by blockchains as we're thinking about it. But as Stefan said, today we don't say internet is run by TCP IP or give me your TCP IP packet number and I'll send you an email. You just send an email. And in the future, we will be going into self check-in hotels with no employees. We will be flying with our smartphones, no more boarding passes and no more uh, passports. Uh, you will be ordering your medicine through your app, delivered to your home. You don't have to call your doctor. I'm an asthma uh, patient. And the amount of paperwork that I have to go through and the phone calls and the whole waiting lines to get my inhaler is simply absurd. And this can be replaced through an app and a vending machine next to my house that gives me my medicine. But for these things to happen, you need a network. You need 
a network of trust, and that what is the blockchain going to deliver and to can, us. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Why uh, is this future not possible without blockchains and in, in centralized systems? It, it is The future is possible in centralized systems, but the risks we are taking are much, much more higher. Today, Because? A, a, today a fine on GDPR compliance goes up to millions and hundreds of millions of dollars. And the way to prevent that is simply decentralizing the data structures that we have. So even governments, they're saying, we don't want to take the responsibility of saving data and let it pile on paper while we have an infrastructure, digital infrastructure that we can trust, that cannot be hacked, and it is unhackable as a technology. The Bitcoin network from 2010 till today, 13th of May 2019, until this second, is running 24 hours, 365 days in a year, nonstop. If I want to, if I want to do a Christmas transaction on any Dutch bank, it won't go through because it's a holiday. If I want to order my medicine on a Saturday, Sunday, I can do that. It's a holiday. We are in 2019, so. And how, how about you, Stevie? I, I'm really excited for, um, I think a lot of the same reasons that Tay is. Um, I think that um, blockchain, setting aside the, the data size limit that currently is, can be a bit of a challenge with speed. I, th I think the idea is that the distributed ledger permits data to move faster, more efficiently. And, and that's desirable, whether you're dealing with a, a social cause, whether you're dealing with understanding whether that organic tomato you bought, where it really came from, or whether you're talking about a, a payment system um, from your phone for, for an item you want to buy, or for some other reason. I think it's a compelling type of technology. I really do. A lot of the applications revolve around automating stuff, right? And making it more efficient and fast. But is automating even more work out of our uh, economy? Is, is that what we really need? You mean <clears throat> removing work from our economy? Well, and automating it. Um, there's been a, lot, a big debate uh, about the um, impact that AI has on jobs. But hearing from you guys, I have to be worried about my job as a journalist for, from blockchain as well. You have to worry about your job tonight, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that there's really evidence in the, in the last history of the last couple of hundred years that automation reduces employment. Like I, People always make this argument, but I think if you look at history, you don't see that. And that would be my argument for uh, this. I think people are very frightened of te technology in the future, but if we look to the past, uh, when cars t took the place of horses, it didn't reduce employment. Um, there are many examples of this. You know, Every 10, 15 years, something happens, and uh, somehow we're still all employed, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm not worried yeah, so about we, that. So we, we'll figure out other stuff to do if uh, AIs and blockchains do work also, for us. I, I truly believe that we'll be working with these machines. I don't think these machines will be doing all our work. I think they will be helping us. I really don't believe in this uh, you know, society of robots controlling us. I, I don't well, the, the, main, the main worry is that it will go too fast for a lot of people to adapt. And if I, oh, that's uh, possible, if I hear yeah. your stories, then the, the pace of change is picking up also because of blockchains and, and, and cryptocurrencies. So right? the technological divide is, is real, and that, that is an issue. I, I, I would say that that is a big problem. I think there might be a distinction between what the effect of AI might do and what the effect of blockchain what might do. What do you do. think the difference is? Well, I think that um, the, the blockchain technology provides us generally um, speed, efficiency, um, we don't need that sort of verification we normally get because we rely on the distributed ledger. We believe it's, it's, it's generally a more secure system. I think those are the sorts of benefits that you get. And those sorts of things, you're right, they, have a, they do have a cost savings. They will cause some things that people do today 
to not need to be done anymore. And the example I use is uh, elevator operators and people like that, where we've sort of moved moved on. But um, I think that that's sort of different than um, than what might happen with AI. And I'm not sure AI is as close in time um, mm. as as blockchain technology is. So there might you you think that blockchain will uh, change work faster than artificial intelligence will? Yes, I do. I actually okay. I agree with I agree with um, Stephen's. Uh, basic premise on that on that point. I think that blockchain is potentially um, very revolutionary and or transformative in terms of what it means for business and also business quite and fast. Consumers. Because yes. I, I thought AI was everywhere and blockchain was still in its infancy and sort of picking up pace. And AI was already sort of making all kinds of jobs obsolete. But you you think that blockchain might? Uh, that's sort of my. That's sort of my oh, thought. That's interesting. I would, I would, I would like to bring in the um, crowd as well a bit. Do, do people in the audience have have questions? I believe we have two mics walking around. Well, we have our Mister Cryptocurrency sitting right uh, behind him, Mister Blockchain, uh, Vincent Averts. Um, can someone bring a mic? Do you have one? Yeah, I'm fascinated about. Uh, I'm fascinated about your role. You come flying over to America, and it's. I mean, blockchain and legislators have a real hard, uh, you know, yeah. relationship, because I mean, everything always thought, everybody always thought that blockchain was the same as crypto, and it's not, and it's changing the way the back office of companies work. What do you do with? Uh, how do you educate legislators? How do you work with the regulators? Sure. What do you, what do, you do? Well, I think it's so. First of all, if you look, at, if we look at change, whether it's technology, whether it's financial innovation all of these things, um, I think what you, what you sort of get into is a classic case where either we have something new and we say, oh, this thing, we have rules about what you need to do. Let's make sure we apply those rules. Or you look at something new and you say, oh, this is different. We don't have rules. And, and so one of the things that um, we were talking about before uh, the presentation is that um, many regulations are a reaction. They're a reaction to a lack of guidance. And so one of the things that we saw in connection with crypto winter is we saw, the, we saw uh, some cases of concerns about fraud. So a case that happened in the United States was, was some people that launched something that was called My Big Coin. Sounds a lot like Bitcoin. And, um, and so people lost money, and so they reached out to um, uh, the commodities regulation, regulators and said, look, we lost money, you're supposed to protect us, can you protect us? And so I think one of the challenges that we have is either we proactively regulate something, which many people don't want. They say, oh, I just wanna go ahead and, and do it first and get deal with it later. But when you do that, if, if, if there is any bad conduct, then you get this reactive legislation. What I try to think about is how can, how can so I, I am a regulatory nerd, unlike a technology nerd. How can I, as a regulatory nerd, help businesses with the tools that we have at Walters Kluwer? What can I do to uh, help you navigate that path and what's not clear and what might make sense for a change in the law proactively and those things all cost money and you might, what, what, yeah. what, do, what do you think is best do we do we need to wait until uh, more trouble come from blockchains and cryptocurrencies for for laws or should we be more proactive with that so there are a number of efforts in different parts of the world to obtain safe harbor treatment in, under laws and regulations for the treatment of blockchain or, or digital development, whether we call it, you know, in the states they're still using the term fintech, or whether we're talking about um, the rules that should apply to cryptocurrency. And, and so I think that some of the things that participants are doing, and they're saying, let's proactively try to get guidance. So in the US, in the US there's a question about how, um, um, 
Should there be proactive guidance in the US rather than waiting? And um, a number of Congress people wrote a letter saying, yes, we think there should be favorable, proactive guidance mm -hmm. to facilitate these sorts of things. But the, the, the lack of regu regulation is obviously one of blockchain's strengths and its promises, yeah. right? Uh, but it also creates uh, some trouble. Uh, over dinner, you told us a very gruesome story that was in the news lately. Maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit, because that might show what a lack of regulation and oversight might lead to. We can share actually two stories. One is how bankers get a raise when they money launder. That's what regulation is helping. And I think that's what regulators need to do before coming into the crypto world is fix their own kitchen and make sure when a bank or when a manager is money laundering, he goes to jail and he doesn't get a raise or a promotion. Okay, now the gruesome blockchain story. The gruesome blockchain story is, uh, in the Netherlands, there was a, a case where uh, criminals, they uh, tortured a Dutch guy in front of his four-year-old daughter. They were drilling his kneecaps because they need to take his coins from him. So the lesson of the story is, if you have coins, always say, I have nothing on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, your neighbors. But does, does this actually relate to a lack of regulation? Because we have regulations against drilling no, no, into no, people no, in no, Holland. No, no, I should, we should ban drills <laughs> than here, yeah. yeah. But no, this, the crypto, and I, 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 I specifically say about the cryptocurrency sector, needs to live under one standard, innovation without permission. Once we put regulations and once we put rules, then we're killing the innovation. That's what killed David Kwam in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam in 1990, when he first came with the first digital money. It's a Dutch invention, guys. You must be proud of it. But what did the regulators do? They chased him. They came into his office. They seized his servers. And he had to go to the US. But Bitcoin came from this city, the first digital currency. And you can go to the KVK and Look at, uh, look at the Chamber of Commerce of David, uh, David Kwam's uh, company. So, so no regulation according to you. But um, the discussion on that, especially regarding the internet, has shifted over the past months or uh, say one and a half years that internet to some extent had the same kind of promises that the blockchain now has. Radical dem democratization, radical decentralization. Uh, people would be the boss of their own information. The same, it, there's an echo <clears throat> there in those promises. And that didn't quite play out in the internet. We, we now see that that led to monopolies and the lack of regulations has led to maybe even the hacking of, of, of democracy itself. Yeah, I think it's f how do you look at it from which perspective? So yes, there were bad apples and Facebook is one of them. It hacked our democracy and it hacked our personal lives. <coughs> Alexa is another one. If you think there is a perfect AI working in Alexa, you're mistaken. There is people listening to your conversations. But they're not just any apples. They're the, the only apples that are left. That's the problem. Yeah. They, no, no, no. They're not the only apples that, the, that are I left. like the word apple in this. Yeah, sense, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And that, that's, the, that's the third <laughs> company. Um, you know, with this um, discussion of the person who was robbed for his Bitcoin, yeah. And uh, and and the the use of Bitcoin to commit to buy illegal substances the, these these things always come up. But I think your point about um, the the use of the dollar or the euro for fraud is just uh, in, at a much higher scale. Yeah, you and think people it's a, are robbed constantly for euros and dollars. And I really find it curious that people somehow separate cryptocurrency from that and make it into a, a unique, a uniquely it's dark a, form. It's yeah. money and people want your money and, and that's what happens. It's you a, get it's your a test. Yeah. So w when, when you launch a new car, what do they do? They take it to their field, uh, test fields, and they test it in mud, in water, on asphalt, on, on every type of road that they can find. Mm -hmm. And similarly, cryptocurrencies, if they only survive in the angel's world, then it's not money, then it's not a form where we can transact in. It must be lucrative for criminals, 
for drug dealers, for pedophiles, for angels, for everyone. And then we can say that's an acceptable form of money. Right, which is great. As, as simple, <laughs> as funny as it sounds, yeah. as simple as it sounds, but this is the characteristics of money. No, I think that's a very basic truth. Well, we have a regulatory nerd here who might <laughs> yeah. want to chip in. Well, the, so my reaction, so here's sort of an interesting question that you, I think that, you know, that, that everyone talks about, which is when you come up with something new, do you get sort of a sandbox or do you get a chance to sort of grow your plant and see how things happen and, mm. and let something go up? Or are you going to be subject to the same rules as other things? Because again, I think my response would be, I don't think of cryptocurrency or blockchains that involve payments. Because again, it might be a blockchain payment system that raises anti-money laundering issues. It doesn't just have to be cryptocurrency. Sure. But but when I think about it, my question is, should, should uh, new technologies be less regulated than other, than other things? And that's sort of a comparative analysis. And there, I think, you know, what you don't want, I think, as a matter of design, is you don't want to do things that are going to unnecessarily punish uh, some, somebody doing something new. And I, that, I think, is the balancing act. At some point, like you said, at some point you say, this is just like everything else and should be subject to the same rules and regulations, or you're gonna deal with that reactive regulation. There'll be somebody who's not as good about the use of new technology as you are, and then that bad person will do something to, to ordinary people, and governments will react and regulate. So that, and that's, the, that's history. So that's, the, that's the, the worry. How do we treat things fairly? Is there another question from the audience right there, sir? Oh, yeah, I, th I think the lady there was, was already raising her hand at the previous question. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll come back to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for all your talks, by the way. I have a question for Tufik. Uh, you said like uh, government is having our identity. And uh, you said it like, in a way, blockchain is not going to change it. But when we get self sovereign identity, I think governments still need to verify our identity. Digital, right? So wouldn't governments still own your identity? They would verify your identity, but they would not own it. That means you have the control to share, to store, and to verify with other institutions. Uh, but the data itself is, is with you and under your watch, and not in the vault of Ministry of Justice or, or, or somewhere else. That's how today emails work. Email is partly from Google, but it is under your control. The she, government, she's giving you quite a skeptic yeah. look uh, yeah, there, Tim. Yeah. How, how, would, it, how would this have solved your specific problem, actually? Putting, putting your identity on the blockchain, how would... That it's have not prevented putting you from identity on the blockchain. It's doing Please digital identity via blockchain. Okay. Please. Julie noted. Thank you. So if you do that, how would that have solved your problem? How would that have yeah. prevented you from to, ending up in Terra Apple? Number one is from 1990 until today, I would have been able to prove that I was born in Kuwait, that my birth certificate is valid simply because I own it. It's on my device. It's on my cloud and I decide with whom to share it with. Yes, it's verified by the government of Kuwait, but they do not own it. It's not in their books, it's not in their ledger. When a baby is born in the Netherlands, he's born with debt. When a baby is born in the US, he's born in debt. We're not giving the chance for people to build their lives from zero. They're born with minus 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 euros, could you, could you elaborate for. a bit on that? Because I don't quite understand what you're saying there. Uh, to my knowledge, we're He's... not born with debt, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, we're, we're born with the debt of our governments. Is, is that oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Um, I really would like to hear your, your next question. Cause you, yeah, you, you're still looking very skeptical. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, too, Faye, but I have the feeling that like the government will have like a data service and have your identity on it, and the blockchain will have like hashes and pointers towards that data. 
So you wouldn't be really having your own data on your mobile phone, but it will be like still at the data solus of the government. So if you lose your phone, you can request your uh, identity again. That's how I think how it will work. True, hashes and pointers are illegal by the European uh, Union. You're not allowed to hash personal information on the blockchain. That's because of our, the new privacy law. Yeah, from the new GDPR law, if you hash, and today there was an article also about that, hashing your name or your date of birth or any type of data and registering that immediately on the blockchain, it's against privacy. If you can, you can take my name and hash it and register it uh, on the chain. And through a few trial and error, by guessing how I write my name, you can just crack the formula. And Soft and software algorithms today are really good at that. So Let, let's move to the sir right there. Thank you. Um, my name is Egbert Dommering. Um, more recently, the the whole discussion on blockchain has evolved into a more abstract level as systems of trust. If we look at uh, the Bitcoin issue, <coughs> um, we say we don't need a central authority anymore to say that something is money that can re be replaced by a technology of blockchain. But we have many different systems of trust functioning in society, such as professional liability, editorial responsibility, all sort of quality, and we need legal norms and authorities to, to sustain this sort of quality and sort of trust. So my question to this learned panel is, do you really think that blockchain can replace all those different systems of truth, of, of trust? There's so much built up over all the years of uh, institutions and laws. How can blockchains ever replace that? Uh, well, in money, maybe, but, but there are so different, many different systems. Even a political party is a system of trust. Yeah, and, and I think, you I think your question go, is so, very so clear. The whole, Thank you. If you look at the whole... I, I, so I would like to go to the panel for an answer. Well, so I think, I think primarily we're talking about uh, replacing the trust that you need to determine value and to, to exchange value. I think that obviously we, you know, I might look at you and decide that I trust you. I don't think that blockchain will have any, any effect on that within society. There will always, always be other forms of trust. What do you mean by trust? That I don't um, have a pistol on me or something? Or? Yeah, I think that people, you have a sense or, I mean, I haven't been looking at you, but if we spent some time together, I think I would have feelings about whether I trusted, trusted you or not. And, um, you know, I don't think blockchain would ever have an effect on that. But um, in terms of trusting the exchange of value, definitely blockchain will, will, will remove that big question and the need for a lot of, of middle people. I guess that's what we're saying. I saw you sort of leaning into the microphone, Stevie. Oh, sorry, sorry. What Exchange of value. I mean, if I'm talking about paintings and antiques and whatever, do you think that blockchain can replace an exchange of value of paintings and art and, and oh, sort most, of most definitely. And I tried to explain oh, really? that. I tried to explain that uh, somewhat with this. Uh, blockchain is being used now very effectively to uh, track the provenance of, of very rare artwork, for instance, which now. Uh, the provenance of artwork is based on trust and handshakes and little manila envelopes with papers in them that are scattered around the world. And so there's a, the, the amount of fraud in the art world right now is astounding. So if you attach, um, there are different ways to attach signatures and fingerprints to physical objects. And yes, you can most definitely remove questions of trust in the exchange of those objects. I think it'll be tremendously valuable for that. What, 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 do you, what does the panel think are the, the, the main exciting, the most exciting applications regarding this trust? Uh, 
So, Walter, with um, the trust thing for me, I, I get two things in my regulatory nerd thing. So, so we talk about a payment, and one of the things that we have in financial transactions is, is that, you know, if I hand you $20 or 20 euro, and you give me the object I ask for, we do it together right there, I, I make sure I don't give you that money until <laughs> I get that object, right? That's the... And, and yet, if we took a 100, 100 euro, 100 million euro transaction, we know that we would have that money wired. We know that you might custody the asset. It would be a process to make sure that both of us get our value out of that exchange. And so one of the, I think one of the exciting things about tools like blockchain for payments and cryptocurrency are the innovations to try to make that super efficient. And, and I think the, a simple example would be the so-called atomic swap. Uh, where Sorry? Atomic a, a, swap. A, atomic swap, which is just basically, it's a, it's a term that's used to describe the transfer of cryptocurrency by two parties. And it really could, could be any digital asset. But where you use a smart contract to make sure that both parties have performed. So I give you the money, you give me the thing, and maybe the thing is another a bit, a Bitcoin. And, and the smart contract protects you and me because if one of us doesn't perform, it, it unwinds and, and yeah. I don't lose my asset. So that's the clearest uh, explanation of what automated trust basically right. is, right? And that's, that's something that Stephen was also referring to uh, regarding the, uh, those DAOs, these decentralized organizations that can render whole companies obsolete. What, what do you think the future of that will bring? Um, you already elaborated on that a little bit, but there's tons more in your book. So what, what do you think the, the, the promise of DAOs is? Well, I, I think it's really uh, honestly beyond my imagination. I think it's a new system, and uh, I think we will see. I, I, I can't claim to be able to describe it. It's something that but I But take, take us in a little bit. Try, try to uh, make us enth enthusiastic about those DAOs. <laughs> so I, let me think about that. Imagine, I tried to make you enthusiastic with the car. So imagine, imagine this. This was an idea by some German artists. And I forget what the name of it, what, what they called it. But so they took a, their idea is to take a forest, buy, buy a plot of forest that needs to be protected, install monitors in that forest that uh, measure the growth of the trees, the health of the fauna in the forest, the visitors to the forest, charges money to the visitors to the forest to maintain the forest, sells wood that can be harvested from that forest via smart contracts, and then uses the earnings from that to buy more forest. So the forest expands itself with no human involvement, right? <laughs> so the forest protects itself and expands itself. It's an organism growing with the help of uh, smart contracts and machines. And I, I think AI would be involved with that too. I'm enthusiastic already. So that's <laughs> cool, right? Thank you. All right. <laughs> more questions from the audience. Yeah, at the back. Yeah, the sir at the back, please. Okay, thank you. Very interesting talk. So, um, just one question: if if blockchain, you said, is software, um, who is it that is there any one body or group that controls this software? Simple as that. Uh, no, there isn't. Uh, it depends. If it's a private chain, a private blockchain, yes, is controlled by the enterprise, but. A public blockchain like Bitcoin is controlled by everyone who participates in the system. There are um, uh, um, foundations that try to influence the behaviors and the governance of these systems, but the, the end result of, uh, there's, a, there's an art provenance organization called Codex in England that is registering artworks on the blockchain and simplifying the process of getting insurance and shipping art to shows and all of this. And I interviewed the uh, head of that, Jess Holgrave. She's raised millions of dollars for this effort. But her end desire is for this, uh, this company to what she calls devolve. 
until there's no, she's not the CEO, there's no director, and it devolves into a completely distributed system. So I would say that um, the, the desire of most people involved with blockchain is that there would be no central control, no one controlling it. That raises, it raises an interesting issue when you don't have central control because mm -hmm. one of the fascinating things about, about blockchain and cryptocurrency, and you may have read about this in, in the news, is um, you have to ask yourself, where is the value in my digital asset? Mm -hmm. And in general, if you own a car or a house, you might have a key to get in your car or your house, but you've got your car or your house. It's a big physical thing that you've got. With a digital asset, particularly one that's um, distributed by way of a publicly distributed general ledger, everyone has that. So it's almost like it doesn't really, you don't really have a magical copy of that. Your proof of ownership is what's called the private key. And so um, the question is, is the value in the digital asset or is the value in the private key? And many of the attempts, for example, if you want to, let's say you own Bitcoin and you decide to, instead of buying a pizza, you decide to um, borrow money against it. You know, you go to the pawn shop for Bitcoin, you take your Bitcoin in, right? Well, the only way you can really make sure that the lender can get to your Bitcoin is you would want to give them the private key. But if you give them the private key, then they own, you, they own your Bitcoin. So that's why... Um, that's why people get drilled in their... I guess that's why they get drilled in their knees. Yeah. But actually what they, they try to do is, again, use a smart contract to control access to the private key. That's sort of an attempt. But it's, it's really an interesting thing. Not your keys, not your crypto. And wear, wear yeah. knee pads. Wear knee pads, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, maybe one or two more questions from the audience. I would like to go back there. Uh, thank you very much for your very interesting contributions. Um, in the at the start, it was mentioned that it be, would be unhackable. And I would like to know why you think that would be the case. Yeah, I can answer that, yes. So, when I talk about blockchain, I'm talking about one type of blockchain, which is the Bitcoin blockchain. And that stands for an immutable, borderless, open, decentralized, and neutral network. So instead of using James Bond, just remember I and Bond after it. Immutable, borderless, open, neutral, decentralized. <laughs> that what is blockchain about. That's what the Bitcoin is about. To hack into this ledger or to change anything in this ledger, that means you have a window of an average 10 minutes to control 51% of that network. As of today, more or less an average of 7,000 nodes in the Bitcoin network exist, distributed on a global scale, meaning we need 51% of those nodes to be on my side to change the future of Bitcoin but not influence the past transactions. What's written on the past is done. It cannot be changed. It's like the layer of the earth. The more you dig deeper, the harder, the bigger equipment that you need, you can change the surface with your hand. Just do like this and you, and you dig some sand. That's what you can influence in Bitcoin. So it is unhackable. But what is hacked today is the exchanges. It's the companies that are building their software and their protocols on top of this network with zero to minimum experience in security. And they invite everyone to use their platform and then shit happens. And so then the regulation would come and say, yeah. hey, these are not your coins because you don't control the keys. These are the coins of the exchange. And then you form a group and you want to sue the exchange and then the regulator will tell you, oh, but in our jurisdiction, this is not money. You cannot sue them. Tay, isn't there an issue for some of the smaller coins or other blockchains where, for example, if, if it wasn't Bitcoin, couldn't there be a case where I could corner the market for maybe a moment, I could 
for 10 minutes, I could buy 51% and then do for whatever I want. For the smaller ones, it happens on a daily basis. I, for no, the I, smaller ones, yes. Yes, and then second, if it was a private chain, so instead of talking about a publicly distributed chain, if it was a private chain, which was, you know, we talked about that before, I, if, I, if I got control of whoever had access and permissions, then I could True. It, right? So that's why as a academic, yeah. as a holder of a master's degree in digital currencies and blockchain technology, I put Bitcoin here and I put the rest of the world here. And, and just one other type of thing that, I, that I've been reading about lately, and maybe, you're, maybe I don't know if you've seen it, Stephen, but um, the, um, there's been articles about programs that, that um, are being used to hack the private key itself and steal the private keys. And once you have that, then you've got the coins. Now, that's not a full, that's not a, a full hack, but that, it'd be pretty nasty if it was my coins. Or your coins. <laughs> True. Yeah. Yeah, I see one hand uh, there in the room. So let's pop in one last question, probably. I'm trying to get you the GDPR article. So, so or your neighbor. So we can do that what about the drinks. catch 22 of the guy uh, about three months ago who dropped dead, and his his Bitcoin so far has still been lost. Huh. Uh, if he had given the keys to someone to solve that problem, then the catch-22 is that it's out there, the keys. If he doesn't give the keys and he drops dead, nobody can touch the Bitcoins and the value is gone forever. So how do you, how do you rationalize that? Well, you rationalize it by the fact Could that- Could you talk into the microphone, Steve, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, first of all, he might not be dead, for one thing, because it wasn't all his money that he, Lost, so he might be very well alive and and waiting to access that money. But the other thing is that um, yeah, he lost his money. That's one. There's a very definite um, coldness to cryptocurrency in that if you lose your access, if you lose your key, if you lose your ability to recreate that key, then you lose your money, and uh, you've lost money. Yeah, I haven't lost any because I don't have very much, but yeah, it's cold. For sure. I mean, don't you have a friend that has that? So I have, I have friends that say, oh man, I've got to go find that hard drive because I know I've got some <laughs> Bitcoin on there and it's worth a lot now. Seriously, because of this yeah. private key issue. It, it does okay. just disappear. Yeah. If, if, if you were to pick one issue that is solved tomorrow in, with regard to blockchains, what would it be? What's the biggest problem that needs solving? Climate change. <laughs> okay, how would Bitcoin or blockchains help that problem? Well, I think the effort I described that I'm involved with and, and many other efforts like that could help reverse climate change for sure. Yeah. Um, By autonomous I thought you forests. Meant, I thought we were talking about big wishes. Like, uh, of course, yeah, well, yeah. you can, you can uh, chip yeah. in your big wishes as well. I was actually talking about the problems with blockchain that still need solving for, oh, for sorry, the big yeah. promises to actually take hold. Well, I think, I think uh, the, uh, a big problem with blockchain is, uh, first of all, that I would like to solve is this misconception that every time that you discuss blockchain, it has to become a discussion about cryptocurrency, for mm. one. Like, I think that blockchain should be thought about on its own, using cryptocurrency to, to assist it. But I don't think that... I think this is something that muddles, muddles the water all the time. Okay. But so, it, is, it is the biggest application of blockchains and most most famous one right it's the so, most famous and yeah. the most exciting and and the most lucrative but yeah. uh at the moment but i don't think it's i don't think it in and of itself will end up overshadowing blockchain okay. and stevie let, let's stick with the problem that you want to uh, have solved tomorrow regarding blockchains um some regulatory safe harbors i think the I safe think, harbors as in well what i mean what i mean by safe harbor is the idea that i think one of the big struggles for people that are trying to innovate with um with um blockchain is they don't quite you know like there's no clear answer on a lot of the regulatory treatment so i i see 
in general about eight significant issues. And those issues, number one, there's not a clear answer on these eight issues. There's some statements, there's some guidance, but it's not crystal clear. Whether it's anti-money laundering, which you brought up, whether it's tax treatment, whether it's how do you perfect a security interest yep. if you're going to lend against it, there's no clear guidance. So I think that would... That's but would a, would a safe I, harbor be a sandbox or a cage? Would it, would it well, be something that is shielding? I use safe harbor there? because I'm using that term. So again, in, in my regulatory nerd, you know, <laughs> a playhouse, in my playhouse, I often um, think about if there is clear guidance, that's really what I'm trying to say. So what, if, if there's clear guidance on some basic issues, I think it permits yeah. more innovation. So the biggest problem is clarity on rules, Yeah, basically. Dave, the one I'm, problem. I'm totally against regulation. So <laughs> I would say uh, let this baby boy or baby girl live outside so that he can get immunity, he can grow stronger and don't put him in a bubble because we all know what happened to the bubble boy. He dies at a young age. <laughs> because he's not immune, he doesn't take his dose of vaccines every now and then. And we need to have the blockchain with cryptocurrencies or without cryptocurrencies in this open environment where it gets attacked every single minute, every single second of the day. And we make sure that the code is safe, that we are working together as a global community. More than 20,000 developers around the world, we don't know each other. We don't know how we look. We, we absolutely have never seen each other, but we have one common goal, is protect the network and make sure uh, it survives. Then my next wish would come is to have a more user-friendly, a more UX-oriented solutions in the market that teach the people how to uh, use safe But you could only pick one, actually. So <laughs> Then I would say yeah. uh, down with the regulation. Okay. Well, I choose the so, second one. <laughs> yeah, you choose the same one? No, the second one. The, the second, yeah. Okay. Um, to conclude, um, I think it's interesting to see if anybody in the audience changed uh, their mind on the big question of, <laughs> is it a good idea if blockchains ran the world? Was anybody convinced? I see some hands. Do you, do you care to tell a bit about that? Why, why are, were you convinced? Maybe a microphone? Um, I raised my hand because I'm not convinced. Sorry. Oh, you're not convinced. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, please do explain. But I was, I'm also curious if there were any people actually convinced today that blockchains are better than they thought. I'll keep it short. Uh, I'm not convinced because of the last thing that you said. Well, we are working on it and we are doing this. So... Uh, that's an exclusive group, maybe. And uh, also the fact that you said uh, there's a paradigm shift and uh, we're not going to renovate the old house, but, but we're going to build a new one. Yeah. Who decides? And for me, that's a, that's a problem still. Well, there's definitely enough food for thought, even for the discussion afterwards on with beers, if uh, people feel like that. Um, there's a book signing uh, going on in the lobby uh, after this event with Stephen signing his books. Uh, and I believe there's also uh, showing on the screen the upcoming uh, Adams, John Adams Institute events that people can sign up to. And uh, of course, I would like to get a big round of applause for all the speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you.